In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our dear Master, our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, we thank you for your kindness, your mercy, your blessings, and for desiring to draw us, each and every one of us, closer to you. Dear Lord, we want to receive your invitation. We want to follow you. We want to understand you. We want to be attached to you. I pray, dear Lord, that your words would guide us and teach us and inspire us to live a life dedicated only for you. Please take care of all the things that we worry about, all our anxieties, all our problems. We offer them to you, dear Lord, so that we can focus on you. We thank you for this time. We ask that you uh, accept our prayers and intercession of St. Mary and all your beloved saints. Hear us when we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I don't know if you guys can see, but there's actually a lot of room up front. <laughs> you guys need to be closer. So we wanted to start a new series, um, and today is just an introduction, so don't expect uh, t it to be long. I know you guys like long lessons, but today will probably be short. So the kids are going back to school, and they have to study. They're using their minds. We thought, since it's school time, why don't we use our minds? It's important for us to be studying and for us to be learning, too. And... I don't know if this is happening to you, but it's happening to me more and more, is that people start questioning our faith. And I'm wondering if you are able to respond to those questions. Someone asked me a couple of weeks ago, can we do a series or something about how to defend certain things? And although we think faith is not based on logic, our faith is not a blind faith. It's based on things that happened in history that are undeniable. If they had never happened, we probably would never believed. And so it's, an order, it's important for us because there are people that are going to tell you. I just met a doctor like a couple weeks ago. Uh, he, he was born uh, and grew up in the Catholic Church, but he left. And then he just telling me, yeah, you know, people just feel the need for religion but it's not true. Every culture just feels the need to have religion. It's pretty much saying everything you're believing is a myth. And I had a friend who worked at a Christian hospital with me, and he grew up in the Adventist church, and he ended up leaving the church because he had twins, and one of them had a physical problem. And he blamed God. He said, well, if there was a God, why did this happen? So he just left. He started to read all these atheist websites to see if, and he started to ask me these crazy things. Like, was there really an exodus? Was there really the uh, exodus of millions of people through the deserts of Egypt, and yet we don't have um, records? And So then he started to make me think, wait a minute, I got to be able to defend. Not that I was doubting, but that I needed to have a greater conviction. What is the purpose of us doing this topic, not only is it for us to be able to be convicted in what we believe, I want you to be so convicted that you have no doubt. But the other thing is this, I want you to be able to defend it because you never know who needs to hear it. We have an efflux of young people. Young people are leaving the church because they don't understand the church or they don't believe the church can answer the questions that they're being challenged with today in their universities, in their high schools, and in the society around us. People are questioning what we believe and they're saying, we're such terrible people, we're homophobic, we're misogynic, like we're racist, we're, we're everything, and that your religion is terrible. So unless they have a firm conviction of why they believe, they will leave. And so the question is, you know, in the universities, they're trying to say that the evidence 
for there being no God is greater than our faith. And it's amazing, you know, that symbol of where it says evidence, that used to be the symbol of Christianity. It used to be the fish where like that was always like, who, now they're like, oh, the evidence, there's no, no faith. You, you, it, it, there's just so much evidence that you don't, it, it's all a story. Has anyone here been challenged by whether it be co-workers or just the society around you where you're like, is what we're doing right? And it may not even be people that are atheists. It might be people from another religion that are questioning your religion, saying your religion is false. For those of you who grew up in uh, the Middle East might have experienced that a lot. And that's something that I actually want to discuss as well. There's a sad statistic now, this is not necessarily that they polled Coptic Orthodox youth, but they say two-thirds of Christian college students lose their faith. That's a pretty significant statistic, and that's sad because some of us have kids in college or are going to college, thank God for the Coptic clubs and the communities, and still trying to outreach to them, but why are they losing their faith? Because the universities are trying to teach them that there is no God. I remember this was in the... Uh, early 90s before there was internet and I was taking biology classes and our evolution professor was almost making fun of God like how could there be a God that would come up with these funny things about the bird being squirted by a flower and taking it, it like it was like just mocking us and we didn't have the internet to go and search and we'd ask our priests they were not aware of evolution theories either at that time so now it's important for us because our kids are being bombarded with thoughts that are contrary to what we believe. And this is the time where they're trying to discover who they are. This is like a crucial time of their life where they're trying to figure out the trajectory of the rest of their life. These years are some of the most pivotal years. And so you're saying, how come I'm not giving this to the youth? Well, we might. But this is what they're faced with. Right? So... Now all their friends, or not all their friends, but they may have a lot of friends at school that are uh, same-sex attraction, and they're like, oh, you guys, your, your faith is terrible because it's telling you to hate us. Well, a lot of our youth cannot defend the church's response, which is actually love and forgiveness, but we're still trying to practice holy sexuality. Abortion, there's like protests and, and will you come to my gay wedding and then the transgender and then the evolution and it's everything Now, I don't know if you know, but now there's like organizations like again, they're trying to steal our symbol of the fish and Now they have their own symbol This is the symbol of the atheist group now, you know how ours is a cross People are offended by the cross, but so they feel like they needed to have their own symbol. It's all over the media, and there's always questions about whether God is real. Um, sometimes it's in a mocking way. Sometimes it's just in a challenging way. This is before YouTube, but if you were to go on YouTube, there's debates on campuses all over the country, all over the world between atheists and Christians. And there are really powerful arguments on both sides, but the people are not going based on personal experience. And, and so again, depending on who your children end up watching, they could be easily swayed because they've heard a convincing atheist argument without having the information and knowledge to respond. So this is for our children and Christianity and our faith is not dead. It must go on. And that's pretty much because of us. And this is actually Christ's command. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. This is actually a command for us. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. He gave it to the apostles, but if it was just those 12 apostles, then the church would have stopped after one generation. But this was meant for all generations, that we should go and teach people what Christ taught. Can you do it? It's interesting. We went on a mission trip, uh, you know, this summer to, to Kenya, and people who have been in Sunday school their whole lives could not talk to someone who didn't know Jesus. They, they had no ability to say, 
anything convincing of why they believe what they believe. Can you? Can you put up a discussion or an argument that really would be convincing to someone else who's searching? What if God puts you in the path of someone who's searching for God? Would you be able to convince them, not based on theories, also based on faith and personal experience, but could you convince them that your religion, like you guys come here on Sunday, every Sunday, you come early. Some of you give a lot of your money. Some of you spend time fasting and giving up foods. And everyone's like, why are you doing this if this is all a myth? That's a huge sacrifice. Neither you're all brainwashed or there's something amazing that you're willing to sacrifice for. Can you defend why you do what you do? Peter in, uh, you know, in the first century, there was a lot of persecution towards Christians. In First Peter, in his epistle, he says this, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for the hope that is in you. But do it with meekness and fear. This word defense, the Greek word is apologia, which is where we get the word apologetics from. In the early judicial system in the Roman Empire, someone would accuse you, and then you would give your apologia. You would give your defense on why you were innocent. So apologetics is a big part of the church. We need to study and understand, was Jesus Christ really God? Did he really die? Is there authenticity to the Bible, or is it a bunch of stories? Do you know? Can you defend the Bible? Can you defend the resurrection? Because if there's no resurrection, then what's the point of Christianity? None. If you cannot trust the Bible, where do you get all your guidance from? Tolerance and apathy are the last virtues of a dying society. So one of the problems is that we've become very just tolerant and we don't care. Well, what happens to the society is that it continues to go in a direction. Would you guys agree that America is not necessarily going in the direction towards God? But we're going in the exact opposite. We're actually looking like we could be a dying society. The more we go away, but can we convince others or encourage others? And it's not about a logical argument. But it is about knowing why you believe what you believe. Uh, apathy, you know what apathy is? It's just not caring. An apathetic Christianity is a pathetic Christianity. Christianity, we need to care for everyone on the planet because guess what? They're all created by God. They're all God's children. God desires not a single one of them should be lost, but everyone should come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. Do we have this urgency? We cannot be apathetic. And right now... Religion is dividing people in certain parts of the world in Middle East, right? Right now, it's this religion versus that religion. And they're completely opposite. And are they both right? Or are they both a myth? Or if one of them is right, should we all be swayed towards that? Should we have compassion on the other ones and be praying for them as opposed to praying for them to be cursed, but praying for them to understand and to see the truth? We need to be more apathetic. And then easy Christianity is the devil's favorite kind. It's the kind where we can just sit and watch. That's so easy. Let e you know, we got a coffee. We have our bond. And wow, let everyone outside just let the flood take them wherever it takes them. That's not the Christianity that Christ called to. He said, if you wish to follow me, deny yourself carry your cross and follow me. He never once said, oh, it's going to be easy. It's going to be fun. It's going to be comfortable and relaxing. He never once said any of that. He said he would comfort us. Why do you need comfort? Because you've suffered. So this is all part of the Christianity that God wants. He doesn't want an apathetic Christianity. He doesn't want a comfortable or an easy Christianity. He wants us to be true followers and defenders of the faith. So, 
this verse. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. This is our ministry, is to reconcile people to God. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. God is sending you as an ambassador to be able to proclaim what you believe with conviction. So I found this quote about education, objective of science education. This was according to a biologist. It's not to provide the public with knowledge of how far it is to the nearest star and what genes are made of. Rather, the problem is to get them to reject irrational and supernatural explanations of the world. Irrational, meaning there's no logic behind the idea of a supernatural explanation. No logic between a God that could have created and designed this universe and demons that exist in their imaginations and to accept a social and intellectual apparatus, science as the only begetter of truth. Science is the only begetter of truth. It's not history and it's not faith. It's not a spiritual experience. What does science typically examine? Science examines material. Science examines the material world. We're talking about a spiritual world. Science can't really logically prove spiritual realities or disprove them. That's not what science does. You can't do a lab in an experiment to prove God or to disprove God. Come up with one, I'd be very interested to see. So this is just the, some of the things that we're going to cover in the series. This is the last part, but... It's incredibly important for our young generation and even for us to understand where these five questions, these are like the core questions of us human beings. And the reason why there's so con much confusion on the earth is because people don't know this. Number one, where did we come from? We didn't come from another planet. We came from God. But did we come from monkeys? Well, that's what a lot of people are taught, that we came from... So if, does it matter if we came from a monkey or not? Does it matter? Yes. Why? I know, but why does it matter? Yeah, we're made in God's... We're different than the animals. We're rational beings and we have a connection to God. We're made in... Like, we have dominion over all the earth... And if we just came from animals, then there's really no God who created us. There's no God who designed us. So then if you're just an animal, then just live like an animal. You're going to die, right? It's important to know that if I was designed and created by God, then there probably is a purpose for my life. Why did he make me? Well, because he has a purpose. So for a young person to identify their purpose, it matters a lot. They need to know where they are from. I think probably the biggest crisis is the identity. There is an identity crisis in today's world. So now people, if they don't want to identify this as this today, they can identify as that tomorrow. Or, oh, after lunch, I want to be something else. And I don't have to be a human. I could identify as an animal. I can identify as whatever. They don't know who they are. And that's a very unfortunate reality, and your kids are going to experience that in the school. And for those of you who are teachers, you're, you're very familiar with this. It's very challenging. Everything that was foundational is being, I don't know if you've heard deconstruction, deconstructionism. That's the, the mentality. Now, everything that was foundational, that marriage is between a man and a woman, just one man and just one woman, and it's like ordained by God. Now they're like, well, let's remove God. Let's remove marriage between a man and a woman. Let's just remove marriage. And then let's just remove the, the fact that there's male and females only. Now you can be nothing. <laughs> you can be non-binary. You could be binary, non-binary. You could be everything. And so it's an identity problem. We must be able to address to your own children when they're going to ask you, Mommy, I don't feel like a boy today, or I don't feel... Can you talk about it? Can you discuss that with them? All right. The other thing is, this is 
incredible morality how shall we live christian morality is different than every other morality on the planet gandhi who was hindu he looked at the bible and he says this is a crown of jewels the sermon on the mount is the greatest diamond like gandhi who led this peace against violence and was a very peace-loving person he says your jesus is amazing but the world is telling us to live a completely opposite way. You know, sex abounds, pornography abounds, uh, uh, abortion abounds, drugs abounds, alcohol, slavery to, to everything. Live for now. It's all about you. It's not about loving others or forgiving. It's about getting whatever you can, trying to be the best and pushing everyone else to step on them if you have to. Try to be rich. In material things, there's nothing beyond. So eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's actually what's going on. Do whatever you want to do. Whatever makes you happy and whatever you want. If everyone did that, you know, you, I think Gandhi said, what would be the problem if everyone lived an eye for an eye? The whole world would be blind. It seems like our spiritual eyes are at least gone. <laughs> it seems like our... so. The question, the problem with this is, how do we learn to live? Where do we learn our life, our morality? It's from the Bible. The problem is, uh, this young generation, they don't like to read in general. So regardless if it's an amazing book, they don't want to read it. And even if they do, they don't really believe it or feel a responsibility towards it. Do they feel an obligation to obey it? The Bible has gone so low in the mentality or the eyes of maybe our generation, because if we valued it, how much would we be reading it? We would be consuming it all the time. This is my guide. This tells me how I should live. If I put the Bible away, then I'm going to live a terrible life. Do we believe that? You can tell by how important your Bible is to you. So we actually need to defend, we're going to talk about defending the authenticity of the Bible. Is it a God-inspired book or is it a bunch of stories? Can you defend, because there are some religions, most of you guys know which one I'm talking about, will say, oh, the Bible was corrupted and so it was changed and all this stuff. Can you defend that? We need to be able to say, no, it wasn't corrupted. And we have examples of it from the very beginning. So let's talk about how we should live because that determines our path and whether or not we go to heaven. Do the youth and even do we, our morality is based on the God-given truth in the Bible and the principles of loving your enemies, forgiving, praying for the persecuted, and blessing those who curse. It's, it's an incredible morality, and that's why we are set apart. You know the word holy? The word holy means set apart. The Bible teaches us how to be set apart the bible teaches us how to be holy but we need to really be able to defend the bible because if the people you're talking to find out that this book is incredible it does the miraculous it's proven that it can do and it's revealed truths to us that scientists are only beginning to discover thousands of years after they were written wait a minute if that's how it is then maybe there's something amazing maybe there's something divine about this book and the last thing is, where are we going? And this one, I think, is being in America, where we're very materially well off. We're always thinking about retiring and getting the house and getting everything prepared for here. We're always forgetting that we're going somewhere else. It's a lot easier in countries where they're suffering. They're like, I'm tired of being here. Is there something better? They want to go. What do we do? We, we will transplant lungs and hearts and kidneys and everything just to keep you to stay around here. We're thinking that this is the goal. This is incredibly important for us. We did a whole series on orthodoxy afterlife and about heaven and hell and what the fathers and mothers have seen and, and revealed to us in the Bible. And I think that was a, a really great book. I believe we have it in our library, Orthodoxy Afterlife. It's tremendous. It was actually one of the most motivating books where it's like, I wanted to go to heaven. You want to know what's sad? I find that many Christians are not excited about going to heaven. Why? Isn't heaven supposed to be better than here? If you like it here, fine. 
But heaven is way better. No pain, no suffering, no sorrow, no tears, no anger, no, no disunity, no separation, none of this. How many of us are actually anxious to go? And if we had our minds set on heaven, then maybe our behavior while we're here would be on the morality that comes from heaven. So you see, if people do not understand how we live, where we come from, where we're going, why we're here, the world is a mess. I want you to be able to defend your faith. So this is going to be a series for several weeks. If you have specific requests on something that you want to know more about in terms of defending the faith, please let us know. We'll do the research. We do not know everything. Almost, no, not even almost. We do, we'll do our research. We'll try to find the experts. But we want to all be well equipped. We want to be well equipped. I want you to be able to not only be convicted, but maybe I want you can lead others to Christ. That's one of the greatest purposes of the church. And so I want us all to be ready, okay? So bring your thinking caps for the next four or five weeks. God willing, we'll try to learn some new stuff, okay? And again, if you have requests, whether you want to study science, we'll, we'll talk about science, defending the, I'm planning on the resurrection, defending the Bible, and uh, the origin of life, some of that stuff. If you have another thing you want to talk about, let us know, okay? Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Master, our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, you are the way, the truth, and the life. That There's no other greater truth than you. I thank you, dear Lord, for manifesting yourself to us so that we could be even more convicted about the reality of your promises and that there is a heaven and there is a resurrection for each of us. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to appreciate, to understand, and to be able to also uh, discuss with others your truth. That We thank you for giving us the ministry of reconciliation and the command to go and bring your children back to you. Uh, give us courage. Help us, O oh Lord, to be inspired to live our lives according to your will. In the intercession of St. Mary and all the defenders of the faith who have gone before us, hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For those of you that don't like to read a lot of books but like to watch movies, uh, I think it's called The Case for Faith or Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. It's a movie on Netflix. It's about a person who was searching to disprove Christianity, and after finding everything, he believed in Christianity, and he wrote multiple books. Is it, it's either Case for Faith. I think it's Case for Faith. Case for Christ? Pure Flix and Netflix, so watch it. It's it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, documentary. It's actually a movie about someone's life who who found Christ. He could not be dissuaded from Christianity. He realized he couldn't disprove it.